governance will be a challenge. It will impact not merely police, but it will impact every aspect of governance. And therefore, when we talk about new policing formats for developing incredible India and smart cities, firstly, let me turn to incredible India because uh, my view is that if India is to grow with jobs, which is a key challenge, we are growing at 7%, but our challenge is to grow at 9%, 10% plus year after year for three decades or more to be able to lift a very young population above poverty line. But you can't have growth without jobs. You need jobs to be created. And actually, tourism has a very big multiplier impact on jobs. And uh, it has its job creation is almost four times more than manufacturing. It has almost about three times more than the services sector, any other services sector. And therefore, it's very important that we drive travel and tourism. In August, you know, we had in Niti Aayog organized two very unique events in which Prime Minister spent about almost six to seven hours per day, over four days, which we call the Champions of Change. And we had called uh, very dynamic, young, successful startups and CEOs. Uh, we had actually selected people who had made a big difference to India uh, and would had the innovative spirit to change India and to perform. And we'd ask them to list out opportunities for India, which are the areas where India could grow. And we were very pleasantly surprised when a large number of them pointed out that if one sector that holds the promise for a very rapid wealth creation and job creation was travel and tourism. We have many uh, uh, favorable factors. We have history, we have culture, we can attract tourists uh, who are experiential in character. And, uh, and I think this is one sector which can create a huge, huge amount of jobs. Well, one of the key factors which is holding travel and tourism back in India is the security aspect. And the perception of India being a rape capital has had a huge detrimental impact on women tourists coming to India, unlike many countries of the Southeast Asia. We've had many, many incidents. Uh, to just give you an example of a British couple camping on the banks of River Ganges in Patna district getting attacked in Asad recently in November 17th and getting attacked with sticks. Uh, uh, incident in Fatehpur Sikri which is really the travel and tourism capital of India. A Swiss couple was attacked in Fatehpur Sikri on October 22nd by a group of local boys and hit with sticks and stones. Uh, so when you have incidents like this they travel all over the world. And uh, in today's world of social media, these incidents catch. Uh, really, the news spreads like wildfire. And my view is uh, that India needs to put in place one of the finest tourist, tourism police establishment in each state of India. And some states have taken the lead. I was Secretary of Tourism in Kerala, and we had some similar problems at that point of time. And that was pretty early, uh, almost a decade and a half back. And uh, we had put up a tourism police which did a remarkable job, which did an excellent job. And therefore, my view is that security perception of India needs to change. And uh, my personal view is that BP R&D needs to work on this and work in partnership with the states to look at examples of how great world destinations provide security and safety to their tourists. How does Switzerland do this? How does, because the world is, the world of travel and tourism has changed. If you look at the hospitality institutes of Switzerland, Lausanne and many other places, they were all designed for the Western tourists. 95% of the Western tourists has already crossed his geographical boundaries. He's already traveled. But if you look at emerging nations of China and India, actually only 5% of us have really crossed our geographical boundaries. And much like in 70s, when we saw Japanese tourists being led by a Japanese guide in front with carrying a flag, you will see a huge number of Indian tourists traveling. And they will first travel to Indian destinations. And simultaneously, you will see a vast number of, as India's economy grows and expands, you will see a vast number of international tourists coming to India. 
And this, if we want this to be a major driver of growth, if you want it to be a job creator, we as a country need to put uh, safety and security right in front and looking at some of the best global examples across the world. So this is an area where I think a huge amount of work needs to be done and uh, BPRD needs to take the lead in this. The second critical point I would like to talk about is the importance of police and the need for perception management. And I was recently going through this uh, research done in 2017 by Pew Research, P-E-W Research, which is rated to be amongst the best research in the world. And uh, I've always believed, and I've worked with some of the finest police officers, and I believe that they're some of the most outstanding people, and they put in a lot of unique hard work. And actually, a part of my family only comes from the police services. But as an institution, the confidence in police still remains low, whether we like it or not. And as per Pew survey, comparing the comparable, public perception, uh, police is better placed than religious leaders and corporations, but much lower than national government, media, court system, human rights organizations, etc. And yet, as per the same survey, crime and terrorism figures as the most important domestic issues. And therefore, in the entire spectrum of governance, importance of law and order and efficient crime management uh, needs to be stated. And there is a need for a very focused and sustainable campaign to instill confidence in public. And th there may be confidence, but I think as a public perception, as an extension and mass communication exercise, as police as an agent of the people, and uh, needs to be done. So if you look at uh, if you look at the Pew survey, 84% uh, of the people said that crime was an issue, 76% said terrorism was an issue, 74% said corrupt officials was an issue, 73% said lack of employment opportunities was an issue, 71% said rising prices was an issue. But crime still, as a perception, remained very high, 84%. And therefore, therefore, I feel that there is a need to instill confidence and fight this image. And how do we do this? And uh, my, pers my perspective is that we need to modernize the police. And uh, we've we in Niti Ayoga very strongly supported the pr proposal of Ministry of Home Affairs of implementing a scheme of assisting states in modernizing police force. But I would like to go a little further and I would feel that there is a need to very transparently rank states in terms of their performance in modernizing police, only modernizing police. You know, when I was secretary DIPP here, I started ranking states on performance on ease of doing business. The first year we did this on 100 outcomes, Gujarat came number one. But the very next year, new states of Telangana and Andhra Pradesh actually knocked out Gujarat. But the good thing was that the eastern states, which have always remained backwards, Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh came fourth and fifth. They, and they took a vast number of measures. So once you start ranking, you're actually naming and shaming states. You're putting it in public domain. And that's, to my mind, in a democracy, is very important for good governance to become good politics. And therefore, if you want politicians and bureaucrats and administrators to have a stake in modernization of police, over a period of time, ranking and putting it in public domain will do a lot of good and I would recommend that much like we are doing ease of doing business and now we've moved over to health and education which we'll soon be announcing on how states perform. It'll be worthwhile to look at outcomes and you can have indices on parameters, capture them on real time basis and do this ranking on a real time basis, put it in domain so that states can compete on a minute to minute basis on a real time basis, create a huge sense of competition 
BPRND needs to develop an index on modernization and preparedness of police to combat crime and monitor it on a real-time basis. There's no point giving out statistics at the end of the year. It has no meaning. And therefore, if you do it on a real-time basis, capture data on a real-time basis, and this is, many of us in government work on data, which is 2011, 2007, all this is irrelevant. To my mind, real-time data must be captured, put out on domain, rank states, uh, say which are the best performing states, which are the worst performing states, and start naming and shaming states, you'll see a huge improvement, and you'll see a huge political commitment for change. So my request is that uh, we in Niti IO will be very happy to partner BP and r and uh, to create this huge sense of challenge of what is good governance as far as police is concerned. And this will bring in a huge efficiency of police modernization. Thirdly, uh, my view is that police, uh, as an important first responder, and it's very important that while there's a huge effort at new urbanization, there's a huge effort at this 100 smart city urbanization mission. And each one of these 100 cities that are urbanizing are focusing on waste, they are focusing on water recycling, they are focusing on roads, they are focusing on technology. But somehow I find that the, this entire program of smart city is not in getting integrated with police. And without police not getting integrated, we'll create a huge vacuum in our governance. So my view is that the Smart City Movement of India of 100 City is a very well-funded program. It's one of the important strategies to leverage technology for benefits of the citizens. Uh, be it cleanliness, water supply, electronic services, last mile connectivity, each one of them which will bring in ease of living to the people of India. And it is therefore necessary that police must get very closely integrated with the Smart City program. And to my mind, all essential services in a city should be provided. I mean, if you go to Berlin, or if you go to New York, or if you go to any other city where all smart cities get integrated, you need a common control room. And there is a very important need to design a good monitoring system and really co-opt policing into this as a very integral part of the smart city movement. Fourthly, I think uh, there is a need and there are some very outstanding examples of great performance by police officers in different parts of the country. Some really great work is being done by some very outstanding young officers. And there is a need. Many of them are doing very outstanding work against some of the greatest odds this country faces in combating uh, left-wing extremism, in combating terrorism, in uh, providing great policing at subdivision and district levels, and there's a need to share the best practices. And we need to collaborate and provide a great model of where all these great examples can technologically be put forward and where each one of us can learn from the examples of others. And therefore, uh, I would, the last point I want to make is that whether we like it or not, technology will be the biggest change agent. And uh, technology, we're the only country in the world with a billion mobile, we're the only country in the world with a billion accounts, we're the only country in the world with a billion biometric. And actually, uh, this is going to change the way we do business in India. This is the way we govern in India. I use my mobile to do all peer-to-peer -peer transfer of my money or even merchant transfer money because of great apps like Beam and Tage, which Google has come up with. They're very easy and simple. And therefore, my view is that in the next all government schemes are getting transferred using biometric. This has brought in a huge level of efficiency. And in the next three to four years, you will see that actually when you use a debit card, you're paying 1.5%. When you pay f use a credit card, you pay 3.5%. But when you use your own biometric and your, your own mobile, you're paying virtually zero. So in the next four to five years, actually India will be the harbinger <laughs> of one of the biggest disruptions in the world we'll end up making debit card, credit card, ATM machines all technologically redundant. And it'll be biometrics which will drive change. And therefore it is very important 
that the citizen police interface must be very mobile friendly. We must have mobile friendly feedback apps and India's mobile penetration being very high. It is very important to link mobile on the crime and criminal tracking network and systems. Uh, unless all of you are implementing the CCTNS and it is essential that mobile based apps are included in the system, the apps you uh, will include relevant apps for crime reporting, intelligent updates, fingerprinting, scanning, work, basket, maps, hotspot, and citizens can select and use these apps best suited for the current role. And I think in a way this will help involve the citizen in prevention of crime. Enhanced mobile interaction between citizens and police officers will be become extremely simple user-friendly interface because of this. And I think the next is about online application and while a lot of progress has been made by police in many states in this area, still there's a long way to go. An important requirement is to enable the citizens to track their own application and their own complaints. I mean the bottom line is that if a private cargo operator, and this is all happening in real time basis, there's a startup called Delivery and if you go there in Delhi, uh, if you go there, a private cargo operator, he allows me tracking of cargo, online retailers allow tracking of delivery, taxi operators allow tracking of my movement, railways provide online booking, uh, suggestions of alternative trains and PR training, police can't be left behind. And therefore on a real time basis, if I'm making a complaint to the police, I must be able to track where my complaint is and when do I get a solution and whether I'll get a solution at all. And therefore, every single FIR, every single complaint must be put on real time basis. The last point I want to make is about the use of social media. The Boston police had used Twitter for frequent and transparent updates to citizens during the Boston Marathon bombings and the use of social media eventually led to the capture of the bomber. Uh, the International Association of Chiefs of Police survey revealed that of the 92.4% of agencies that use social media, 77% use it for investigations and 74% reported that it has helped them solve crime in their jurisdiction. So while many, many uh, city uh, is uh, police, uh, many commissioners of police, many urban areas, many SPs, many young officers have started using social media, I think as a conscious policy, we need to push the envelope more and more for police officers to use this. I also want to turn to the reduction in response time because the time has come to harness technology to further reduce the response time. One application is web-based portal in key area. And you know, uh, this will, there's an urgent need to launch web-based portals for registration of complaint information, tracking of such complaints and feedback to citizenry. And many, many areas, and I think BPRND can review the efficiencies of the different such portals launched by many state governments and examine the feasibility of launching actually a national level portal. While the back end may be designed in the manner in which, uh, in accordance with the responsibility given in the Schedule 7 of the Constitution, the front end may be seamless as the citizenry uh, is need not know, but the front end can be seamless. And again, I think one big area of growth will be the area of data analytics in identification of vulnerable spots and of suspects. The government of India has already launched the advanced stage of NatGrid project with the objective of linking important databases to provide information on criminal activities. Digital traces left behind by a large number of activities are very, very valuable assets for you. Since CCTNS is also nearing completion, there's a great scope of using data analytics for generating real-time valuable information. Some of the applications that to my mind are very, very readily come to my mind are about analysis of traffic accident related data and transport network to identify vulnerable spots, analysis of crime data to identify vulnerable areas, data analytics to trace, trace movement of suspects, identification of transactions which have security implications, and identification of suspects and their surveillance. 
So huge, huge need for bringing in technology, uh, enhancing our policing. But whether we like it or not, there are two trends which are very clear. One is that India will urbanize. And India will urbanize whether we like it or not. India will urbanize rapidly. The challenge is, how do we do it? When you travel from here to Jaipur, you will see a lot of urbanization. It's all unplanned. How does India do it in a, in a planned, sustainable, innovative manner so that it can add value to our growth? How can we use it to lift a vast segment of our population above poverty line? Because urbanization drives creativity, it drives growth, it drives uh, progress. Cities are the centers of growth. Cities are the centers of progress. So urbanization is inevitable. Secondly, the onward march of technology is inevitable. Whether we like it or not, mobile will be your default option, and the world will do all its transactions, both for official and for personal purposes, through mobile. And therefore, how do we use this power of the small gadget of mobile to ensure better data analytics, better research, and better policing holds the key to our success for new policing formats for developing both incredible India and smart cities. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Now I would request Sri S.P. Singh, DG NSG, to give his talk. Thank you very much, ma'am. Good afternoon, sir. Shri Amitabh Khan, CEO Niti I.O., Dr. A.P. Maheshwari, IGBPRND, <coughs> Ma'am Sampat Meena, IGBPRND, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak on this August occasion. I would be very brief on the theme of today's uh, visionaries uh, summit, that is the need for an integrated think tank for policing. The need for a think tank is something I have been very passionate about and I feel that it has got lost somewhere in the maze and challenges of day-to-day -day policing. In my own small way, I have made several attempts in this direction till I got a chance to establish one in the NSG and named it as CATS, that is the Center for Anti-Terrorism Studies. The think tank was based on the premise that we are all warriors in some way, but need to become scholar warriors. And recently, when I was given the temporary charge of the BPRND, it dawned on all of us that we already have a think tank in the BPRND. I am happy that this need has been aptly flagged by the present DG in today's visionary summit. Evolution is the essence of society and hence every aspect of life associated with societal norms must keep pace with the transformation not only to remain relevant but also to contribute positively in this change. The so-called institutions that today are called think tanks emerged in the 19th century in the United States of America and the United Kingdom. An early example is the Franklin Institute, which was set up in 1824 in USA, whose founding purpose was to honor Benjamin Franklin and advance the usefulness of his inventions. The Royal United Services Institute set up in UK in 1831 was engaged in the study of military affairs. The Fabian Society set up in 1884 claims to be the British oldest political think tank. The early 20th century saw the creation of several such institutions, including the Brookings Institution and the Land Corporation in USA. The term think tank itself came from World War II slang for the rooms where strategists discussed war planning. The, 90s, the 1970s and the 80s saw the mushrooming of think tanks worldwide working on environment and sustainable development. And gentlemen, this is something which is not uncommon to India. As you are all aware, India has had centuries-old tradition of providing advice to the polit political administration 
for sound decision making. Our cultural her heritage has been a repository of sagacious knowledge passed down the generations for spiritual as well as strategic wisdom. Indeed, Arshastra by Kautilya is a shining beacon of strategic thinking which enabled the expansion of the modern empire and has relevance even to the state. India today is credited with having the widest range of think tanks in South India. What do think tanks do? Think tanks aim to provide information and analysis that policymakers use to make decisions, build the wealth of common knowledge and serve as a repository of that knowledge. A think tank also enables a synthesis of official and ac academic knowledge and facilitates discourse with similar think tanks and international organizations without constraints. Such think tanks also increase the number of options and raise the quality of decision making. They promote and push for change through new ideas and networks to influence the policy making process. Think tanks have played a pivotal role the world over in preparing and shaping the future in virtually every field of life, be it policy making, administration, judiciary, safety or security. Of all the fields, security is probably the most crucial as lapses can damage the very sovereignty of the state. In India, a precedence exists in the defense forces for security related think tanks. The first defense think tank was set up way back in 1860. At present, the defense forces have six think tanks. The defense forces think tanks have a core area of competence, though they also venture into other fields such as strategy, diplomacy, and international relations. In the Indian context, in the Indian police context, whether it is fighting terrorism or containing insurgency, or Naxalism, or dealing with complex law and order, or crime prevention and detection, there is a wealth of knowledge and data that security forces generate. This vast data needs to be captured and collected, documented and collated, analyzed and disseminated to the stakeholders. We all feel the need for a revamped criminal justice system which is suitable for the digital age. We need to redraw the cyber policing landscape, especially in the wake of the challenges of the dark web, cryptocurrency use and enhanced inscription. There is a pressing need to explore and ideate how changes in crime, technology and public expectations have changed the policing landscape of the country. We need to look at the notion of evidence-based policing, which advocates the value of statistical analysis, empirical research, and testing of hypotheses based on randomized controlled trials. Brokering ideas, stimulating public debate, and offering creative yet practical solutions is the need of the hour. And finally, <coughs> there is one area of criticality where I would like to draw, draw your kind attention to. As, a, as an area of grave concern for the internal security of the country, the police is deeply involved in fighting the scourge of terrorism. The world is gap grappling with the menace on a war footing, and scores of think tanks have mushroomed all over the world to assist their governments in this fight. I am afraid we are yet to even start with the army, the CAPFs, and the state police forces at the fo forefront of the city effort. It will only be prudent for us to think in ways to bolster our strength and synergize in, combat in combating terrorism. I also believe that security and defense cannot remain the exclusive preserve of the, of the uniformed forces. The civil society, with its acute awareness and a sense of ownership, brings to the platter a unique perspective which we op may occasionally overlook. Thus, an accommodating platform to bring the divergent views will be immensely important for us to derive relevant lessons and formulate a roadmap not only to fight but defeat and decimate the scourge of terrorism. In recent times, the need for autonomous free thinking think tanks has become inescapable as many a times they have to play the devil's advocate and bell the cat by propounding ideas and theories which may be at variance with the well-established